I'm going to show you game four of the semi-final candidates match between Bobby Fischer and Bent Larsen. Now, in the first three games, we know Fischer won them all. If you haven't seen those, then do check out the playlist up there. Click on the info tab and you can see all those games. Um, Larsen basically was trying to hit back against Fischer straight away. It was a slightly different situation to the Taimanov match. Uh, again, you can see all those games if you want to check out the Fisher playlist in the video description. Um, Larson was trying to hit back straight away. And, well, in game three, he had a complete disaster because he obviously um, mixed up his opening variations. But in game four, Larson continued this strategy of being as bold as possible, you know, he is such a confident player. Um, he didn't want to put the brakes on at all. So in game two, Fischer against c4 had played c5. Here Fischer just went for g6 and very quickly they went into a king's Indian. Fischer, of course, uh, well, loved playing the king's Indian. Um, but it's a brave decision. You know, he's not afraid of... Larson's preparation. So it's one of the main lines and now the knight comes out so that white has to do something about this pawn here so the pawn goes on and well there are many moves here b4 is very popular these days the so-called bayonet variation 91 is the main line as well but we have knight d2 from Larson. So the knight spins back, adding more support to e4, preventing a knight coming to h5 because the bishop's on it. And maybe later on you can bolster the e-pawn with f3 as well. Many ways to play this position. c5 actually um, has kind of sometimes is, is some commentators frown upon this move because it gives white something to bite on on the queen side straight away. And you know you could say it does the job that white is trying to achieve anyway because the, the d6 pawn is weakened. But it is a kind of bulwark on the queen side. Um, you know, there are pros and cons to this move. It, it, in some ways it's quite solid, but yes, it does allow white to, to open a file straight away. Um, instead of c5, a5 is the most popular move there. So rook b1 and b4. So Fischer just remains solid with b6. And of course, in dropping the knight back, he's preparing the, the standard f5 move. So a4 from Larson. So both sides just going for it for the moment. So you can see why some people feel that c5 is... Um, well, you know, does the hard work for white. But, you know, white can open files very quickly and try and get counterplay. Um, and, and it's not so easy for black to force through you know, his the typical attack with f4, etc. And here, well, you know, one could simply take here and play f3. That's been seen... Um, a few times, but Larson went queen a4. So now there is a threat to take on b6, exploiting that pin. So therefore, bishop d7, and the queen comes back to a3. Bishop h6, yeah, it's not really appropriate to push on with f4 yet, um, as there's it's just too slow, this this plan with g5, g4, and white has counterplay on the queen side. So bishop h6, you know, in a way this is um, more positional. You know, black is hoping to put pressure on e4 and maybe exchange off this uh, dark squared bishop, this so-called bad bishop. And Larson played bishop d3 here, and afterwards... Taking on c5 and a6 was recommended, and um, certainly that's not bad. You know, maybe the rook can come here, um, but bishop d3 actually isn't isn't a terrible move. So 
for loss and exchanges. And now he takes on f5. And here, well, some commentators recommended knight b5 in order to exchange off that light squared bishop. And there is something to be said for that. Um, but, well, black is pretty solid here. Larson played bishop c2, so perhaps he's angling to play bishop a4 to exchange off those bishops. a6. Good move from Fisher, making sure that white doesn't play a6 and controlling the b5 square. And now we have some exchanges that take place. So knight e4. You can see this diagonal has opened up. So yeah, if that knight's taken, then the bishop drops. So bishop takes bishop. And now, of course, we um, flick in the, the check. Black recaptures and rook takes. So Larson, with that little trade, has managed to connect his rooks, which all looks very nice. But actually, it's done black uh, some good service as well, because now you know, it's easier for black to connect rooks as well. And you've got to watch these pawns too. But it's still very double-edged position. Now I think here is where Larson really you know, makes a misstep, you could say. White is still okay here. It's still very, very sharp position, very tense. Well, f4 is possible. I know this looks a bit crazy having moved these rooks to the queen side, but actually f4 blocks that pawn. If knight g6, then let's just hold that pawn. And if pawn takes, we can move this rook across. And if white can blockade on f4, then he's doing pretty well. So, you know, black might continue with something like this and play f4. And we've got a really tense situation. Um, you know, white can switch back with a rook, um, maybe take here as well. It's really unclear. It's also possible to play queen b3 with the idea of queen, bringing the queen back. Uh, down to either b6 or b7, that's possible. But rook b6, this sends the rook really up a bit of a blind alley, as we'll see. Threatening rook takes pawn, so bishop c8, knight e2, and f4. That's a key move, so often a key move in these kind of situations. And what happens now reminds me a little bit of Carlsen's recent games with the Sveshnikov, actually where he has these E and F pawns that form a kind of barrier, and then he switches um, across with the rooks to attack the king here. It's a very similar kind of strategy. I think that when Larson went in for rook b6, I think he overlooked a tactic. Let's have a look at this. Rook c6 attacks the queen and the queen comes over. So all this starting to look very nice for black with pressure down on the king's side. And here Larson should probably play king h1, but still it's pleasant for black. Rook b1. And I think this was rook b1 simply a tactical oversight. Because it seems as though Larson is gonna be in time to move this rook down and perhaps trade off pieces and and maybe break through, maybe win a pawn on the queen side before black has a chance to attack. But I think he had overlooked that knight h4 was actually possible. I suspect that Larson thought this was impossible. I think he'd been planning rook takes bishop in this position. So let's have a look. Rook takes bishop and then queen h3. I suspect that's what Larson saw and thought this is impossible for black. But in fact, after this, 
Fisher wins the queen. The queen is trapped. So after knight h4, Larson doesn't have this tactic and had to fall on the defense. By the way, if rook b8, then simply bishop f5, and there's a problem here after, let's exchange rooks, and you can see that this bishop is attacked and there's going to be a problem here. So basically, white can't keep playing actively and has to fall back on defence. And in this case, that is absolutely fatal. And now Fisher just goes straight ahead on the king side. All black pieces playing here. So, um, yeah, just trying to get rid of that bishop and break through here. And in fact, white has no decent defence. Um, g3 won't be possible because the rooks will break through here. Let's see what happens. So f3, this just blows up uh, white kingside. Um, obviously, pawn takes pawn, queen g2 mate. Can't be captured with the bishop. The, the, the queen is on, so knight g3. That pawn was taken. Check. Bishop takes opens up the f-file and knight f3 and knight d2 and that was the final move of the game the knight forks queen and rook and after that rook takes pawn is coming in as well total destruction and you can see this rook is left high and dry on the queen side but as i said i think that larson thought this was possible because of that tactic and you know, when that tactic didn't come off, then he starts looking really foolish, but it's basically just a tactical oversight that prevented him from, um, yeah, counter-attacking in this game. So it all looks very smooth on paper. Um, but once again, you know, Fisher basically played faultlessly and exploited Larson's tiny mistake. Yeah, and as I said, it does look very reminiscent of some of Carlson's recent games with the Sveshnikov, where his opponents also overlooked some kind of tactic and and, and, and uh, Carlson just broke through on the king side. Okay, folks, uh, more coming soon from this match. So after four games, Larson was four down. In fact, after this game, he um, took a timeout his doctor advised him to take a time out and uh, he was suffering from high blood pressure. If you remember, exactly the same happened to Taimanov as well in his match against Fischer. Thanks for watching.